All right. Yes, well, thank you for joining us for Bible study. Feel like join us for worship, 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 waiting on Jesus and Bible study. Mm -hmm. and those of you online, thank you for joining us too. Yeah, so praise God. We're going to jump back into the Word. We're in Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 21. And I talked about the first several verses of Acts chapter 9 last week. But for, for the, 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 the context and the picture, we need to go back to verse 1. But just kind of a quick, uh, just a quick catch-up moment. In Acts chapter 8 was whenever Stephen was arrested and put on trial. And then we go through Acts chapter 8. Stephen, of course, he testifies. He recounts a lot of the Jewish history, you know, the travels of the Hebrews and a lot of their history. And then, of course, uh, you can tell there's a, a turmoil right about, at the, I'd say, three quarters through Acts chapter 8. There's a kind of a, you can tell because Stephen transitions from a nice uh, storytelling moment of their history to you stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. So you can tell there was, basically there were, it, it seemed like there was something going on. They were either ignoring Stephen or they were having some kind of a dialogue or dispute on the council. And they were more or less just kind of shutting him out. And more, he was just kind of standing there because he sensed that they really were ignoring him, didn't pay any attention to him, and didn't really care about what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you stiff-necked people, Jack, just like your fathers did whenever they killed the prophets. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and, and, he, and I like it, this is kind of a, a paraphrase thing at the end. He says, and you went a step further, and you killed the promised Messiah too. So you didn't just do what your fathers did, you killed the Messiah too. And uh, it says whenever he's talking, he was speaking with such anointing from the Holy Spirit it says that they started, it means they actually started yelling and, and gnashing their teeth and they were just yelling and covering their ears because they didn't want to hear it anymore. They couldn't, they couldn't handle the anointing. They couldn't handle the presence. And uh, people will run from the anointing. People do two things with anointing. They run to it and they run from it. Mm -hmm. They will, they'll do that. I've seen them do both. I've seen people run to the anointing and I've seen people run from the anointing. I've had people run from me, physically run from me because they felt God's presence. Mm. I was talking with a, a lady one time. I was helping, the Lord gave me an interpretation for a dream she was having when I was in the military. And I'm sitting there sharing this interpretation with her. And there's a guy sitting on the other side. We had a lot, little local laundromat on base. And there's a guy sitting in a chair over here. And as I'm talking about God, the room filled with his presence. And the guy sitting there and the legs going, she's just rattling. He's sitting there shaking in the chair. And I just thought, I said, and I'm sharing, she can feel God's presence. I said, see him? And he's just sitting over like this number, just trying to listen, but he don't know what's going on. I said, Holy Spirit's touching him too. And when I didn't point at him, he jumped and he ran and he took off out the door. But I've had other people run from me before too. And it's they're running from Jesus, not me, but just the anointing. And I've had other people like, man, I just want to hang around you. I don't know why. They're running to the anointing. Isn't that great? But that just shows you how powerful Jesus is. His presence. It commands something. You know, there is no plan B with Jesus. You're either in or you ain't. And that the anointing is like that. You either receive or you don't. And that's huge. And I, gosh, I could keep it. We could just go right here. And then, but anyway, I won't go too far with this. But I want to say that I've had people before that God has given me a prophetic word for them or God had something specific he wanted to do in their life. And, and they were not open to receive it. I was actually manning a table at a, at a conference one time and this lady was walking up and the Lord started giving me a download, a prophetic download that was very detailed for her and the thing is I was like okay, she walked up to the table and she got to the table I said I have something to share with you, is it okay? and she said, uh, I, said I feel like God gave me something to share with you to encourage you and she said and she said Okay, but when she said it, Holy Spirit backed off. She quenched him. She said, okay, but she was not open to receive. And Holy Spirit just backed off and said, no. And I've had some people that were involved in cult groups who knew I was a man of God and wanted me to pray for them because they had to have life decisions and they wanted to hear from God. And these were, this was actually a leader in a major church group that's not a, not a, not a Jesus-focused group. And he really respected me and wanted me to pray when I prayed with him. And uh, you know what the Lord said? The Lord said, I'm not telling him anything right now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. So I just prayed a blessing. You know, you know I, did, I, I said, I prayed a blessing for him, not what he was doing. Remember? I've shared that before. You can always bless the person even if you can't bless what they're doing. 
Okay, so anyway, we, now we're going to jump into this, but there's so much here that we can just talk and talk about. But the anointing, it always draws a line, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, praise God. So, and oh, let me just go. Can I go step forward? Everybody okay? Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is people confuse the anointing and the presence of God. They're not the same thing. Mm-hmm. All right. The, the anointing is evidence of his presence. All right. So if Jesus is inhabiting your life and you're humble and you're yielded and you're submitted and you're all in with Jesus, his presence is going to be strong in you. So the anointings will be as strong upon you. Okay, so the anointing is evidence of his presence. So that's a whole other teaching, but I want to kind of hit that. But they're not the same thing. And you'll see a lot of people who aren't in a good place with God, and every now and then they'll be anointed because they'll be the only person there at the time when Jesus wants to do something. But to consistently walk in the anointing, you have to consistently be filled with his presence. Whatever. All right. Okay, so now back to the back to the Bible study. Uh, so now we, you know, we they they stone Stephen at the end of chapter eight, and then we roll into chapter nine. And like I said last time, chapter nine is the key transition point in the book of Acts, because from chapter nine verse one forward, the book is predominantly about Paul, Saul the apostle, Saul who gets converted on the road to Damascus and becomes Paul the apostle. So the rest of the book is mostly about him, his labor in the Lord, his service to the Lord, and also his suffering and the thing that him and the other apostles and disciples go through to serve Jesus. So it's kind of a transition point in the book of Acts, chapter 9. All right, so here we go. And, and we talked about this last time, so I'll do a light review here. I won't get deep with this. So in, chapter, in verse 1, it says, During those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder the disciples of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so he went to ask the high priest and requested a letter of authorization he could take to the Jewish leaders in Damascus, requesting their cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way. And it's talking about followers of Jesus. So says Saul wanted to capture all the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained authorization left for Damascus. All right, really just a quick review. Remember, Saul was standing there in Acts chapter 7, 58, and he was holding the coats of those who were about to stone Stephen. Remember, he guarded their garments. Uh, He was all in. He hated the Christians. He hated that new movement. You know, and he he was trained at Gamaliel's feet. So he was trained by one of the most well-known, most well-respected Jewish theologians of the day. But there was a, there's a thread here. Gosh, there's so much in this. There's a thread that's beautiful. Gamaliel's dad was Simon. His father was Simon, who was waiting at the temple to see the Lord's promised Messiah before he passed. Remember? I've told him that. So Simon, who was waiting there whenever they dead, brought, brought Jesus and dedicated him, he was waiting there because the Lord said, today you'll see the Messiah that I promised. And then he, he blessed the baby Jesus. And he said, now I can die in peace, for I've seen Israel's salvation. Remember that? That was Gamaliel's father. And so think about the house Gamaliel was raised in with a man who worshiped and loved God that much. And then Gamaliel was teaching Saul. So there was a thread in there, I believe, that was in Saul that was the birth of the passion, I think, was in his lineage. And it came from grandfather to father to son. I really believe that. And so it just went right on down the line. And then Saul was a recipient of the passion and the fervor for God. It just had to be turned. It just had to be adjusted. But Lineage is valuable, church. Lineage is valuable. And Mary, do I, whenever we pray, do I ever not pray for our family? Have you ever heard me not include the family when we pray? Every time I pray with any of my kids, I pray for our family. I want them to get that quality. You know, when I pray with other people, I may or may not bring up my family, but in my family and in my bloodline, they will hear me pray for my bloodline. They will hear me pray for my offspring. If I don't do that, I'm being a crappy patriarch. And that's that's what we model. You keep it going. Those of you with kids, you keep it going. Anytime you get a chance to pray with your family, pray for your family and let them see you pray and seek God for the benefit of your family and your lineage. All right. So anyway, Saul's on the way to Damascus. He's got his letter. 
He's got his rage and he's got his letter. And he's heading for Damascus. And uh, we saw earlier that he was dragging both men and women out. And that's what I was talking about. He wouldn't have been dragging the women out if they weren't causing him as many problems as the men. You with me? So the men and women both were representing Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is an equal rights Savior, an equal rights Lord, and an equal rights God. Yep. And so so Saul and Saul was no respecter of persons either. Yeah. He was getting everybody who was causing problems, men and women. So he came with the letter. He's on the way to Damascus. And uh, it's neat because uh, whenever he, get, he, Damascus was 130 miles actually northeast of Jerusalem. So he's on the way. And I actually shared this. I thought it was kind of neat because today Damascus is the second largest city in Syria, Damascus, Syria. It actually holds the record. And I've just, I mentioned this last week, but I'll do it again. As the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. Yeah. And that name. There's evidence of human habitation dating back around 9,000 BC. Isn't that interesting? Mm, yeah. But it says basically there was a lot of little groups and tribes, but they merged about 2000 BC. That's when they all merged together and formed the, the official city of Damascus. And that name, talk about some history and some lineage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he was basically, he was on the way uh, to get the people, <laughs> to get the Christians. And uh, he, it says right before he got to town, actually, oh, let me keep going, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me actually read the word here. Just outside the city, and I think it's right, right as he was getting, I, I, my opinion here, okay, this is Dana's opinion. I believe it was right as he saw Damascus on the horizon. And he was getting excited because he was going to mess those Christians up. You with me? I don't think Jesus did it right as he left Jerusalem. I think it was he was just stewing. You can imagine. Isn't that how God is? He, we get where like, I'm going. Yes. And right we get on the legs, like the edge of it. Just like, no. <laughs> and we got a toe like, <laughs> like just like, but I believe he got him right before he went into town. And just outside the city in three, the second part here, it says a brilliant light flashing from heaven. It actually means a lightning storm when you look it up. It was like a lightning storm around him. Mm -hmm. It says a brilliant light flashing from heaven suddenly exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay. The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless. <laughs> Isn't that something? That's a little bit of what, what happens in here. And whenever I'm sitting here and we're here, when Jesus shows up, even though we're used to, we're never really used to him, but we, he's familiar to us. We are literally stunned and speechless. There's times I can't say a word. There's times when none of us, we, we just like, we're kind of stunned and speechless. <laughs> and, uh, or they heard a heavenly voice, but could see no one. So I replied, who are you, Lord? This was Saul's salvation moment right here. Because we're going to see a little further on. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and then he was water baptized. All right? So, but it's neat because that, and it says, actually it goes on uh, further down. Let's see, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all this too much, but it's, uh, I don't even have it in my notes. But I think it's, it's later in the book of Acts that Paul actually is recounting. He's standing before for, uh, King Agrippa. And he's recounting what happened. He said, you know, King Agrippa, I was on the way to Damascus with letters. It said, all of a sudden, this, this lightning storm happened around me. And it said, he said, all of us hit the dirt. So his entire company and traveling companions, when the Lord showed up, they all hit the ground. And I talked about that last night. I call it carpet time. People call it slain in the spirit. You're not dying in the spirit. Yeah. That is a misrepresentation. Jesus ain't killing nobody. What he's doing is he is overwhelming your electrical system because yeah. he's more powerful than we are. Yep. And your electric system goes, I'm done. I can't get done. <laughs> and then you, you do carpet time. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I mentioned lots of references to that last week. There's lots of examples of people falling out under the power of God in the Bible. So it is biblical to do carpet time. All right. So let's keep rolling. And so he says right here, it says, I am Jesus the victorious, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city. It's like now you're ready to go into the city. It says where you will be told what to do. And that neat. This was actually the ascending moment. You see that now get up. 
See, Paul been doing everything in his own strength up to this point. As you remember, gosh, remember Moses. Moses said, and uh, is in Acts chapter, I think in Acts chapter seven, when Stephen's recounting Moses' journey. Moses said, you know, he, he kills the Egyptian, then he tries, he uses his, it says he's, he's mighty in, in, in deeds and words. And so he tried to do a mighty deed. He killed the Egyptian who was abusing the Hebrews. And then the next day he, he was mighty in words, so he tried to reconcile the two brothers. And the one who was hurting the person said, oh no. But I'm kind of going somewhere with this. What's neat about this is Moses said, I, he thought they would understand that the Lord has sent him to be their deliverer. Remember? But God had not sent him yet to be their deliverer. He sent him 40 years later, whenever he was on the mountain, God said, now go. You see the same thing here. It, the Lord saying to Paul, now go. This was his commissioning into the ministry. This was it, literally his ordination to be the Apostle Paul right here. Now get up. Now's your time. Now's your season. Now you're going to do it for me and not for yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. There's so much here. So I just barely touched it. There's so much here. So Saul stood to his feet, and even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind. And thing is, the first thing I thought was flash burn. I was a machinist to work in a welding shop. You get flash burn and you see nothing. Yep. You know what I'm talking about. And if it's bad enough, your eyes will actually puss and they'll get nasty. And I think it's interesting because he, he was blind, and I think it's because he just went through a lightning storm with Jesus. <laughs> so the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. And I think it's neat. These are the same men who were just kissing the dirt with him. Yeah. They led him into Damascus. It says for three days he didn't eat or drink and couldn't see a thing. And I think it's neat. Three is the number for God. Yeah. Isn't that neat? So for three God-filled days, <laughs> and I want to say another thing. My heart aches for Paul because can you imagine those three days of him realizing what he did to believers? I really think those three days of him not being able to see in the natural, the Lord was giving him time to chew on his old life and to chew on his old actions. And to, and, to, and to really fully embrace his new journey. Isn't that something? Review time. Yeah, that's right, Grant. Review. Yeah. It says in verse 10, 11, it says, Living in Damascus was a believer named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, called his name, Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias. The Lord said, Go at once to the street called Abundance. I love this translation. Go to the street called Abundance. How many of you like live on the street called abundance? <laughs> yeah, that's good. And it says, I look for a man, so I was starting to dream a little bit. I got distracted. I was, I was going into abundance. It says, and look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. You'll find him at Judah's house. While he was praying, he saw a supernatural vision of a man named Ananias coming to lay hands upon him to restore his sight. Isn't this amazing? And I think it's neat because Ananias, I love that. I got all off my notes, which is fine. But Ananias actually means the Lord's gracious gift. Mm -hmm. And that neat. Paul spent three days in review of his brutal previous years towards the believers. And then he, 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 he's reviewing this. And he can't see. And, he, and he, he's had a, a, like a serious encounter with Jesus. And here comes the Lord's gracious gift of healing. Church, God really is in control. It's no accident that Ananias, you know, the, the Lord's gracious gift happens to be the name of the guy who comes in to lay hands on Paul so he receives a gracious gift and is healed. I laugh a lot of times at just how much God is in control and how little we believe it. Quiet, I'm scared. Oh, we think, oh, the world's coming apart. You're just fine, church. And you're better than fine. Ain't nothing going to mess you up or take you out that Jesus doesn't sin. All right? Or allow. You're fine. You know, if we get this right now, we'd be a whole lot happier with it. Just <laughs> one thing. Quit freaking out and enjoy more. Uh, let's keep going. 
Well, stop. It's good having you guys here. I, I like looking down and seeing my daughter here and son-in-law. I mean, I like everybody, but it's special having these guys here. I don't see them often enough. Here is the day, Bruce. <laughs> but I love you too, Grant. <laughs> Not the same. <laughs> well, uh, let's move on. <laughs> oh, praise God. And I'll say something really for your supernatural vision. Um, we talk, I, we do prophecy training here pretty much every year and all. But when you, a vision is a movie trailer. I'm just recounting that. It's just a movie trailer. You know, whenever you want to see a movie, you get a clip of it. And that way you see what see what it's about and see a little bit about the story and see all that. And that's what a vision is. A vision is just a God-given movie trailer. Mm -hmm. And this was a, probably a waking vision. But guess what? You know what a dream at night is? A sleeping vision. There's no difference. A dream is a sleeping vision. A, a daytime thing is a waking vision. They're both the same thing. There's movie trailers, and God just chooses whether to give to you when you sleep or when you're awake. A lot of times he gives it to us in our sleep. Because during the day, this is too busy for him to get through. Mm -hmm. So he waits till we shut down enough and then says, now I can slide that revelation in. Good. Yeah, but a movie trailer, that's the best way to explain it for people to understand. And you try to explain it any other way, and people will be like, unless they're used, you know, unless they're used to hearing from God. All right. It says, I like this. Ananias is replied, verse 13, but Lord. <laughs> and I replied, many have told me about. His terrible persecution of those in Jerusalem who are devoted to you. In fact, the high priest has authorized him to seize and imprison all those in Damascus who call in your name. I like it. He says, but Lord, knows he don't want to go because he's afraid, he's scared. And then he tries to hedge his bets. He says, in fact, Lord, let me point out some details that you probably didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Now I won't I won't stay here too long because I definitely don't want to get everybody upset with me. But has God ever spoken to you and you pointed out all the information that he didn't know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I figured I was in the right group. We had all of us. I can't tell you how God has spoken to me like, but God. <laughs> And then we always try to hedge it because we really have to have a good, if we're going to God, we better have a good case to present. Oh, yeah. We never just say, but Lord. Yeah. Now, but Lord. When we start going down the list of reasons, and he'll sit right there and he'll listen. He's so patient with us. He's a good father. But he'll sit there and listen and, and he'll listen. And you know what will happen after he listens? You know? He'll tell you the same thing again because he didn't care about that input. He loves you and he'll listen to it. But he, whenever he tells you something, he means it. And our case will never change his mind when he's leading us into his best. Yeah. All right. And it says, verse 15, it says, the Lord Yahweh answered him, arise and go. You see that? He didn't change his mind. God told him to go. And I gave him this great reason why the Lord said, okay, Anas. now go. <laughs> I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. He will be brought before kings, before many nations, and before the Jewish people to give them the revelation of who I am. In verse 16, I will show him how much he is destined to suffer because of his passion for me. Well, Paul did suffer. He went through so much, and eventually he was beheaded in Rome. Yeah, according to history, when he was beheaded before the emperor, his head bounced three times, and every they cut it off when it bounced. Every time it bounced, a little spring of water came up where it bounced, mm. according to history. Oh, what? A spring of water, just a little bit of spring kind of started squirting, right? It's how his head fell off his body. It was like, toom, 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 and they said three little springs came up where his head bounced. It's according to history. Wow. And that's something. But he was eventually martyred. He was eventually killed. Um he was stoned to death one time, and the disciples gathered around and were prayed, and he was resurrected back to life. That's in the scripture. Um, and, and he he went, you know, he shipwrecked, floating around in the Mediterranean. Uh, he went through all kind of mess, bit by the snake, of course. That's a great teaching in itself when he was helping them gather firewood on Patmos, and uh, the snake bit him. That's a great teaching. In fact, I probably will teach that again soon. That's a good teaching. I love it. It's, that's a good church teaching. <laughs> 
that he gathers firewood, he's bringing firewood. What he's doing is he came into a new group of people and he wants to help. And so he gathers the firewood and brings over, he adds his firewood to the fire that's already going. And it's just a great teaching because there's a fire going at the gateway when people come in, they want to add their wood to our fire because they want to fit in. But the first thing that happens when you start working closely with people, guess what? You get bit. Because your character goes with you everywhere and we start working in a new group, somebody's going to rub you wrong, something's going to happen and something's going to rise up and bite you. So it's just a great teaching. Wow. But guess what Paul did? He stood there. And I know it's all our study, but thanks for going with But what he did is Paul, when the snake bit him, what did he do? Shook it off. He shook it off in the same fire that revealed it. Yeah. Remember that. That's what it is. Whenever you're serving in a ministry and you get uncomfortable and something bites you and it gets nasty, you got to stay there and not withdraw and pack up your toys and leave. You shake off that thing right there in the same fire that revealed it and you and Holy Spirit sort it out and get your victory and stay in the game. That's a huge teaching. It's a great teaching for church. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Then you know what happened as a result of that? We'll, we'll get back and listen just one second. What happened as a result of him shaking off in that fire? Guess what? The people around him watched him. Yeah. They said they thought he was going to swell up and die or something bad yeah. was going to happen to him. They were watching how he dealt yeah. with the thing that bit him. Yeah. And that's what we as leaders do. When somebody has an issue and they get upset, we watch how do you deal with that thing. That's just a, a neat leadership thing. But whenever Paul dealt with it the right way, what happened? Everybody around him yeah. respected and honored him, and he was able to minister to more and more people on that island mm -hmm. because he stayed there and dealt with it the right way. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for going down the rabbit trail with me for a second. Mm -hmm. That was a really good teaching for leadership, though. Really good. All right, but he was a special messenger. That actually means a hand-selected messenger. God hand-picked Paul. All right, let's keep going. we pick up the taste a little bit. We've got just a few more verses. And every time we get in this, man, it's like a buffet. There's so yeah, much in the scripture. Mm -hmm. It's like a truckload. It's awesome. So Ananias left and found the house where Saul was staying. He went inside and laid his hands on him, saying, Saul, my brother. You see there? My brother. Saul's so salvation moment was on the road whenever he met the Lord. He said, my brother, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me to pray for you so that you might see again and be filled to overflowing the Holy Spirit. He, want, he said, he sent me my brother Saul. Number one, so you can be healed and also so you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then right after that, we see him water baptized. But isn't that the model we talked about? It. Jesus went down in the River Jordan to John. And we and there's so much in that too. But my uh, gosh, we see the, 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 the process, the step-by-step -step process. Water baptism. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Basically, Jesus was birthed of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. So he was born of God, just like we are. Then he went and got water baptized, salvation, water baptism. He raised up baptism in the Holy Spirit. Ministry begins, effectiveness increases. Same thing here with Paul. All right. So, so any doubt was gone. What's that? The doubt was gone between verse 16 and 17. Yes. It was totally gone. That's good. Yes. That's good. He wouldn't have called him that if there was any doubt. Yeah, and you're right. So a lot happened whenever between Anna and I saying, well, but Lord, yeah. and Lord speaking to him. But isn't that, isn't that the word of the Lord, though? Have you ever had God just speak to you and give you one sentence or one yes. phrase and change your entire life? Yeah. Like Isaiah said, my word is not void. Yeah. It will accomplish what I send it to do. Mm -hmm. His word just obliterates doubts and concerns. That's good, Brent. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so it says, all at once, verse 18, all at once, the crusty substance that was over Saul's eyes disappeared and he could see perfectly. Immediately, he got up and was baptized. He was water baptized. See the step-by-step -step process here. So that after eating a meal, his strength returned. He'd been fasting for three days. He'd been, I guarantee he had been stressed out for three days. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't imagine what was going on in his mind and his soul. I mean, me and you've never, and Paul had killed people at this point. You know he had. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it isn't polite dragging people off and throwing them into prison. Somebody died along the way, I'm sure. You know, and he, and he sat there and supported Stephen Stoning. I mean, he was part of all these things. 
And then he meets Jesus and realizes he'd been murdering men and women of God. And now God's called him into the ministry to represent the Lord whom he tried to destroy. You know, look at the bright side. You're going to be able to talk to Saul about what that was like. You're going to be able to ask him, Saul, what was it like on those three days? We're of all people most blessed, church. One of our last uh, verses here. It says in verse 20, it says, within the, within the hour, look at this, within the hour, he was in the synagogue preaching about Jesus. He had three days there. And then Ananias comes in, lays hands on him, and prays over him. He's, he's, he's saved on the road. He's healed when Ananias lays hands on him. He's baptized in the Holy Spirit through Ananias lays in him. And he's water baptized. And within the hour, he's preaching Jesus. This shoots Christian procrastination in the head. Yeah. It just kills it. It kills it. Yeah. So I was going into another message right there. I'll stop for a minute. Let's keep going. <laughs> we don't have all night. Let's keep going. And it says, uh, but look at this. He was, he was proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 21, those who heard him were astonished, saying among themselves, isn't this the Saul who furiously persecuted those in Jerusalem and called on the name of Jesus? Did he come here with permission from the high priest to drag them off and take them prisoners? And I really think there's right here you see the wisdom of God. You know why? Saul had the largest reputation of anybody currently you know, serving under the Sanhedrin Council. He had the largest reputation as the persecutor and the one trying to destroy Christians. Mm -hmm. So his conversion would have had the biggest impact. That's right, because it was a complete U-turn. Yeah. And that, that's what happened. That, I mean, this is also a picture of a believer. That's what it means to repent. It means to, to, to completely do a turnaround in your head and in your actions. And that's what happened right here. This is such a radical turnaround. I think this right here got credibility for Jesus. The fact that people are like, how is this possible? We know this man. How is this possible that he went from like militantly opposing Jesus to wholeheartedly supporting Jesus? Can you imagine what that did to open people's heart to hear about Jesus? Mm -hmm. Only God could do that in a person's life, that radical of a change. And I'm sure that made a huge difference with the people here. They were, you, know, you know, a lot of times God startles us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He startles us. He comes through in such a big way that we're dumbfounded. We just don't know what to do. Mm. And that's what a wonder is. When you think about signs, wonders, and miracles, I'll say this and wrap up. Um, you know, a lot of people have big explanations for signs, wonders, and miracles in the Bible. Let's keep it simple. I've shared this before. I'm going to share it again. This is simple. See, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I preach the word. I love God, but I'm a simple guy. I want things that I, want things that I can connect with quickly and others can connect with quickly. Because when I represent Jesus or talk to people about something or teach and preach, I don't want people to say, what was he talking about? Keep it simple. Just always imagine you're going on a mission field where the people barely understand English. And use simple, common words and common phrases. That's taken years. I, I, I still can improve, but I try to keep things really clear and simple. And gosh, there's, there's a lot here. And that's actually, that, that was birthed in me through watching a Billy, Billy Graham crusade. I was watching, and he had a call, uh, you know, like a huge football stadium full of people. And he gave this message, and people ran. They ran to the front. And I asked Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, what is it about him that, that helps people respond so quickly? And he gave me three things. Holy Spirit said, here's the three key things about his preaching. That says, <clears throat> be simple, be clear, and stay focused. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. And I, and I, that was probably 25 or so years ago, and I've done my best to integrate those. Be simple, be clear, and stay focused. Isn't that good? Yeah. But that's that's a lot of what I try to do with my preaching, and right. it was kind of hard to start with, uh, but anymore, I, it's just kind of what I do. But um, but I think it's really neat because with with Saul, with Paul here, 
The contrast is amazing. I lost my train of thought on that other thought I had, but we'll stick with what I just did. Because every time I think about that, I you know I go back to that moment when the Holy Spirit spoke with me. Don't you love how God's voice doesn't lose power? Mm-hmm. You can think back to that revelation he gave you 10 years ago. When you really look at it, it'll still have life and power in it. His word doesn't diminish. It's beautiful. Okay. I've gotten way off my notes, which is not unusual. But that's fine. That's just fine. I have another point, but I'm sure we'll get it next week. All right, let's see here. And this is our last verse tonight. Look at Saul's power increased greatly. You see that? As he became more and more proficient in proving that Jesus was the anointed Messiah. Saul remained there for several days with the disciples, even though. It agitated the Jews for Jews. Mm-hmm. Their hero got converted. <laughs> that word proficient, he was proficient on the other end of the stick before. And they knew it. Yeah. And think about as the relationship and revelation poured in and, and, and as Holy Spirit started connecting the dots between all the prophets. See, like, remember, he was trained at Galileo's feet, so he knew the word. Yeah. He had memorized at least the first five books of the Bible. He knew the word. He had knew the word. And, and imagine whenever the Holy Spirit started saying, remember this? Uh, Jesus did that. Jesus fulfilled this. Jesus is the expression of that. This was Jesus in the wilderness. This was Jesus here. This was Jesus. This was Jesus. So that's what it means by proficient. Is, is as we walk with God and we learn more about the word, we become more proficient at sharing about Jesus because we have more revelation of who he is in those moments and who he is in the scripture. And another thing I want to do, last thing I'll point out here, one reason his power increased great is because he was doing what he was supposed to do. You cannot be an armchair Christian and grow in power and anointing. You can't do it. You've got to be out here doing the stuff. You've got to be telling people. You've got to be loving people. You've got to be praying for people. You've got to be laying hands on people. you got to be involved in your local church doing something. you got to be putting your stuff to the to the, to the, to the plate. you got to work the field if you want to increase. See, to whom much is given, much will be required. But to him who uses it, I'm paraphrasing, the Bible says, I will give him more. So, and that's what he's doing. He's using what he has, so God kept giving him more and more and more. And until he was walking in the full grace and anointing of an apostle. But so in closing, represent Jesus, do the stuff, use your, st- use your stuff and do the stuff. That'd be a good one for the law. Use your God given stuff and do your God given stuff. Any thoughts or questions before we close out? I ran a couple minutes over, but that happens sometimes. Anything? Seems like there's people today that are just as bad you know they're being saved too and turning to jesus and it's you know and we're all guilty of holding the hammer and nailing him to the cross you know, amen sin is sin and, um, that's good Lynn. yeah that's good you know radical transformation equals a radical testimony on it that's good anything else before we close out yeah, that goes with that text. What is it? He that sin much is forgiven much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Saul did sin much. Mm-hmm. That's good, Paul. And I bet the memories of what he had did against Christ was the gas in his tank as he pursued Christ. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Joanne. Would you give the definition of anointing? Okay, anointing is, uh, okay, here's kind of a, once again, I, I, you know, this, I'll just share my perspective on, okay, this might not, you know, be the, the exact wording, but it will be accurate. To me, the anointing is God's power that, that is upon someone and flows through someone to do what cannot naturally be done. Okay, it's the power to exceed the natural limitations upon a believer's life. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Anybody got anything else? Okay. I didn't know if you had a thought there. Okay. I just 
it kind of reminded me like a, a it's like a catalyst. Amen. Yeah, well, it's like the divine sticky tape to get the connection to Jesus. Oh, yeah. Well, one last thought, really quick, on laying on of hands. You know, when Ananias went to him, he didn't just pray and he didn't just speak. He laid hands and touched. And we've talked about that a lot around here. And I've demonstrated laying on of hands and not saying a word, and people got their breakthrough and got their things. I love when I teach laying on hands. I'll go up to somebody and lay hands, and I won't say a word. And I'll see what God shows, and I'll speak to that, and I'll say, what happened? You can demonstrate it. What happened? You know, I did it with Sister my sister Mary, the worship leader, not daughter Mary. Sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I did it, and, and uh, Mary didn't know it, and she, she was actually having a lot of anxiety stuff going on. And I saw it through discernment, and I spoke, and I sit there and saw a little boat in her abdomen, and I said, peace, be still, but I never opened my mouth. Mm -hmm. And whenever afterwards, you remember, she said, yeah. she said, everything got calm and peaceful right here, yeah. and I never said a word. So laying on hands, like, there's always a transference. There's always an exchange that happens every time we lay hands on somebody, or they lay hands on us. Preach them to the choir. Hey, Tell everybody. Stop giving a sermon. All right, sister. Well, you're obviously the right one to lead the prayer ministry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, is everybody good? Good night. Good word. So, so until next week, keep studying your Bible and yeah. enjoying Jesus. Uh, let's close in prayer, okay? Leah, would you close us? Father God, thank you for this time, and thank you for your word, and thank you, Jesus, yes, for your presence and Holy Spirit, and bless each one here, Father, and know, meet us right where we are with what we need, and thank you that you love us so much. We pray for blessings upon people who are suffering out there. God, give us an opportunity to meet the challenge that whatever you have for us, and use us as your vessel, and God, we pray this in your precious son's name.